All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Charter Hill Leadership Roundtable. Um, my name is Lachelle Blakemore, class of 89, and I have the privilege of serving as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Development, and I'm just really thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support and all that you do for UC Berkeley. Um, I'm just so grateful that you're here and for your unwavering dedication that you've shown to our beloved institution. Many of you have been part of the Charter Hill Society for years, and thank you for your long-lasting love and support of Cal. Your ongoing commitment to the university's success has not only helped us maintain um, our position as a world-renowned institution, but also paved the way for a future filled with boundless possibilities. Um, and we'll hear more about that in detail from our panelists. The Charter Hill Society serves as a powerful symbol of our extraordinary legacy um, and the time-honored traditions that have defined our university um, for decades, while also inspiring us to continue evolving and adapting to meet the challenges of the ever-changing world. I know that this group of very engaged um, supporters um, is aware of the historic Light the Way campaign. Um, it's been a resounding success, and I thank you again for, for your role in uh, making this history. We had more than 225,000 donors, um, and they turned, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, our donor community turned a $6 billion goal into a $7.37 billion triumph. So thank you so much. This is the largest total uh, campaign for any public university and for any university without a medical school. So um, just an incredible um, success. Last week, uh, we've been celebrating this uh, amazing <laughs> triumph. So we're in celebration mode today as well. Last week, we were um, in Los Angeles with our community of Southern California donors. Um, and we have uh, upcoming celebrations in New York and Hong Kong. Um, we had a wonderful evening um, with inspiring speeches and uh, the band, of course, um, and our, um, our, our campus leaders. Um, and the signature drink of the evening was the Light the Way Espresso Martini Shine. <laughs> so don't ask me how it was. I didn't have it. Did any of you have the cocktail? So, um, but it was uh, just really captured the spirit of the university and of our, uh, the spirit of the, of the campaign. Um, our campus community is immensely grateful for your generosity and for achieving this amazing success. Um, our donors contributed during this campaign $562 million for undergraduate scholarships, $873 million for faculty and graduate students, $1.5 billion for capital projects, and nearly $2 billion for research. So um, as Chancellor Chris is always reminding us, this campaign was really about the core, and you really showed that you care deeply about the, the future of the university, so thank you. Of course, we still have significant work ahead of us uh, to ensure that our university has the flexibility and the resources uh, necessary to pursue new opportunities and to address unexpected challenges and continue to innovate across all areas of the campus. So let's continue to build on the momentum we've created so Berkeley can thrive for generations to come. I can't imagine a more passionate group of uh, dedicated and engaged um, supporters than all of you. Uh, so with that, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Chancellor Carol T. Christ. As you all know, under her incredible leadership, Berkeley has reached new heights and continues to thrive as a beacon of excellence in higher education. Chancellor Christ has spearheaded numerous initiatives that embody the theme of today's event, change and innovation. From her strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
to her visionary approach to advancing research and education, Chancellor Christ has been a driving force behind Berkeley's success. This will be her last Charter Hill Society event as chancellor, um, as she will be retiring in uh, June. Please join me in thanking Chancellor Christ for her stellar leadership. Welcome, Chancellor Christ. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here. So many you know, familiar faces in this room, so much blue and gold. That's really nice. Thank you, Lachelle, for your warm introduction and for your deep commitment to Berkeley. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you, such dedicated partners, and to engage in this important discussion about change and innovation at Berkeley. I, I'm supposed now to give campus news, and it feels very odd to be giving campus news without talking about the Middle East at all, so I'm not going to. But I've been thinking so much about the first sentence of Charles Dickens' um, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, but today we're going to focus a lot on the best of times. As we gather here today, I'm reminded of the incredible legacy of our institution and the countless ways in which Berkeley has been a driving force for change and innovation throughout its history, from groundbreaking research to transformative ideas that have shaped society and the marketplace, Berkeley's always been at the forefront of progress. Our campus is the birthplace of the disability rights movement, where the activism of UC Berkeley students helped ignite a civil rights movement that led to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and continues to shape policy today. Today, we continue to lead in this field with the current construction of a new building for our disabled students program in Dwinell Annex. Similarly, the intellectual fingerprints of Berkeley founders and researchers can be found on a wide range of companies and inventions that have revolutionized our world from large language models pushing the boundaries of artificial intelligence to PCR COVID-19 tests that were crucial in the fight against the pandemic. Even everyday objects like the computer mouse have roots in Berkeley's innovative spirit. These examples are just a small sampling of the immense impact that Berkeley has had on our society and the world at large. Today, we continue to build on this legacy of innovation. In the realm of research, Berkeley is, as you all know, truly at the cutting edge of discovery. Our faculty and students are tackling some of the most pressing challenges of our time, from climate change and public health to social justice and technological advancement. By collaborating across disciplines and leveraging the latest tools and technologies, we're pushing the boundaries of what's possible and creating new knowledge that will benefit society for generations to come. Beyond academia, Berkeley is also a leader in driving change and innovation in the marketplace. Our alumni have founded some of the most influential companies in the world, and our research has led to countless breakthroughs that have transformed industries and improved lives. As you'll hear more from our panelists through partnerships and innovative programs, we're using Berkeley's robust and vibrant ecosystem to ensure that ideas and innovations at Berkeley have a real world impact. Another critical aspect of change and innovation at Berkeley is our focus on the student experience. We're committed to providing our students with an education that not only imparts knowledge, but also fosters creativity, critical thinking, and a passion for making a difference in the world. As we look to the future, it's clear that change and innovation will continue to be at the heart of everything we do. By embracing new perspectives, collaborating across disciplines, and leveraging the incredible talents of our students and faculty, we'll continue to lead the way in shaping a better world. As we move forward, let us embrace the spirit of change and innovation that's always been at the core of Berkeley's mission to delve deeper into how we can continue to push boundaries, ask big questions, 
and create a brighter future for us all. I'm thrilled to introduce our distinguished panel of experts, Raka Ray, who is Professor of Sociology in South and Southeast Asian Studies and Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, Rich Lyons, who's the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and a soon-to-be <laughs> chancellor. Obviously, these remarks were written before that announcement. And ASUC President Sidney Roberts. Each brings a unique perspective and expertise to these topics, and I know that their insights will be invaluable as we explore this important theme today. So let's welcome our panelists and embark on an enlightening discussion about the exciting possibilities ahead for UC Berkeley and beyond. Okay, traditional definitions of innovation call to mind flashy new gadgets. But at Berkeley, innovation extends beyond new things that you can buy from the shelf. Tell us what innovation means within the context of your respective areas. Rich as the university's head for innovation and entrepreneurship, Raka as the dean of social sciences, and Sydney as a student and president of the ASUC. So let me just start with you, Rich, and we'll move right along. Thank you, Carol, and thanks to every one of you in the room, as Carol said, and thanks to Carol, right? I mean, your leadership has been absolutely extraordinary. So, so for me, my working de definition of innovation is two things. New ideas put into practice. New ideas put into practice. Now, a couple things are noteworthy in that operating definition. First of all, um, put into practice is important. So invention and discovery, as profoundly important as they are, are not innovation. That's what distinguishes innovation. Um, notice also that there's no reference to science. There's no reference to venture capital. There's no reference to the private sector. Right? So in, new ideas put into practice. The humanist whose research influences how we implement AI or CRISPR, that is, that is innovation. Now, um, we, ultimately, we want to make sure that we, we have a working definition that, that, that works for us. But when, when we think about change and, and the mission of the university, right? the mission of the university, research, teaching, public service, profoundly important. But the why what it all adds up to is impact. And innovation, new ideas put into practice is a really important part of how Berkeley delivers on the why, its mission, long-term societal impact. Raka. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, so I was thinking about how to define innovation in the social world. And I began to think, well, we can talk about new ideas and implementation of those new ideas. We can talk about just how, in fact, much of what we do, the social, everyday social, economic, and political world we inhabit was created. It is the result of ideas that were implemented. And so I thought, I'm not going to think of a new innovation. I am going to think about a concept that will drive home to you immediately what I mean by the fact that we inhabit a social world that constitutes innovation. And that's the word democracy. Democracy was once an innovation, right? It, it was put into place by people who thought about it, who practiced innovating it and implementing it in different ways. And that is never, and that innovation is never, un, uh, it never stops. It has to continually create and recreate itself to meet um, new times, new people, new societies. But democracy was an innovation. It was an innovation that, that was structured, that was created to build a better world. It was created to build a, a form of government that was answerable to people. So when I think about innovation in terms of social science, I think of innovation in terms of the social world. Just another innovation, the modern corporation. That, that actually invented inventions and innovations, right? Some things had to come into place. People had to think about how do you organize people so that they can be creative? So another sort of way of thinking about social, 
the social world and innovation are all the, these institutions we inhabit, which were innovated once and continue being innovated. Sydney. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here and it's really nice to see a lot of you again and meet new faces too. Um, I think for students, innovation really comes down to three things and the first being challenging the status quo. I, I think um, when you are reimagining something, you first have to diagnose um, where is there room for growth? Where can we improve? What's the issue at root here? So I think challenging the status quo, and I know that's something Berkeley students are innate at. Um, every <laughs> Berkeley student has that change maker spirit um, in them. So that's the first thing I would say for students. And then the second thing um, would be um, creating the conditions for students to take the time to think. I think innovation starts with just one idea and um, the passion behind that idea. So making sure our students' basic needs are met, that way they can have the time to really sit with that idea and make sure it's feasible, make sure they can follow it from step A to step B to step C is really important. Um, and then the last thing I would say is having mentors and being inspired and having confidence in yourself to really believe in your idea. And I think that really comes down to our professors, our faculty, our staff who are um, our mentors for our students. Um, so having those people in your lives who are continuously reaffirming um, your idea and your goals is really important. That way you can um, follow it all the way through, even at the early stages of um, your innovation. So Rich, you often talk about innovation and entrepreneurship as being important to Berkeley's mission to serve the greater good, as well as to the university itself. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so, so let me thanks for, say a little bit more about what I just barely touched on before. Um, you know, w when we think about the deep why, it, it, it's a pretty fundamental consideration. If, if somebody said, I'll just take, take a counterpoint. If somebody said the mission, the deep why, it's profoundly as important as they are, is research, teaching, and service, then you might look at the office that I inhabit, innovation and entrepreneurship, and say, you're way off on the periphery. This is a public research university, which it is. And that is sort of off on the periphery. But if instead the deep why is impact, is long-term societal impact, is how do we take all these ideas that we're generating and get them out into society and create a better society, improve people's lives. Then innovation and entrepreneurship becomes a really important part of how we do that. And so I, I, when I sometimes hear people say the mission, the deep why, is research, teaching, and service, I think it, it, that's, that's a bit too narrow. If you actually look up the University of California mission statement that applies to all 10 campuses, the root, the kernel of that mission statement is long-term societal benefit. And I think that's part what we're doing here. Now, the last thing I'll say here is sometimes people hear that and they think, are we steering this great faculty away from fundamental research? Isn't there a trade-off? Aren't we getting too downstream, too in the market? And I disagree with that view, but people can, can, reasonable people can disagree. I think the more impact we have on the world, for, take Jennifer Doudna, perfect example. She wants to see CRISPR applied, right? She wants to see sickle cell no more in the world. Is she spending all her time doing the downstream stuff as opposed to doing the foundational research? She's still doing foundational research but we need ways as an institution to make sure that our foundational research is also getting in the world. It's an and, right? It's not an or. And I think that's a really important way to think about how Berkeley does the right things going forward and has as much impact as possible. Yeah, I, I so much agree with what you said. And one of the things that's really interesting about this moment in the university's history is how short the distance has become between fundamental discovery in the laboratory and its movement to the marketplace. I had a meeting in the 90s in which we brought together venture capitalists and, um, and some of our scientists because they wanted more translation. And everybody left the meeting just scratching their heads saying, I don't understand how to do this. And now nobody says that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So Raka, I, I, and data science is not only a huge um, revolution in the sciences, it's a huge revolution in the social sciences. How is Berkeley 
incorporating digital tools and computational methods into social science research using techniques like big data analytics, natural language processing, machine learning to analyze vast amounts of social data. Mm. And then beyond technology, what innovations do the social sciences offer the world? Um, let me ask the, answer the first very quickly. I think our, uh, starting with our economists, they've been, we've been, social sciences have been incorporating computational techniques in a, for a very, very long time. Um, in almost every one of my departments, there are people who really embrace these tools. So Emmanuel Saiz and uh, Gabriel Zuckman, our very eminent uh, economists, were able to, precisely because of machine learning, analyze uh, level, like amounts of income tax data that nobody could have analyzed previously. And they were thus able to come up with a picture of wealth inequality that we'd never been able to access without the, the availability of, of uh, the processing of that level, of that amount of data. So that's one. And so, so there are, I could give you many other examples, but what I will, I want to say about what we do is, we've recognized this a long time ago. In fact, my predecessor, Carla Hesse, recognized this a long time ago and set up the D-Lab or Data Lab mm -hmm. through which we have sort of trained thousands of students in data analytic techniques, thousands of social scientists as well as others, so that they can be equipped with the two things everybody needs, social science analysis and data analytic techniques, sort of to go out into the world. And in fact, the keen awareness that this is important made it such that uh, we were able to create, uh, with, the, with the generosity of a donor, a one-year master's in computational social science. Again, and, and uh, we, we, we put out uh, an applications, a call for applications, thinking we'll experiment with 25 people, 400 applicants, right? So the world understands how important this is. And I'll tell you about one new, another program, an undergraduate program. It's called the Yardi Scholars Program. And this brings together social sciences and the College of Engineering to have sort of students figure out how to use technology to solve some of the problems that arise at the, at the intersection of technology and democracy. Misinformation, polarization, misuse or overuse or use of social media. So there are all of these students who have come together to try to work on these issues. I'll give you just one example of, of sort of beyond technology, if I might take one more minute. And again, 1987, two economists, n now Nobel laureates, one just uh, passed away sadly, um, George Akerlof and Daniel Kahneman. They get together and they realize that in order to understand economic problems, they have to use psychology. Yeah. So they start the first PhD class and then that field of behavioral economics gets created. And we use behavioral economics for everything now. How to analyze the choices consumers make, voters make, um, patients make. Right, so that's a, a really a sort of a, a, a revolutionary contribution to both methods and knowledge that has completely transformed the way so so much of the world is understood. Thank you. I want to ask a follow-up question, which is about climate change. We so much think about climate change in terms of the science that tells us what's happening to the Earth's climate, the technology that might create fixes. Tell me how the social sciences are innovative in the, this, this, this life-threatening crisis about the climate that we're all facing. One of the issues that has um, that puzzled me when I first uh, began to look at those who were considered climate experts in Berkeley is that they were all ecologists and scientists. And I thought, well, climate change is all about human behavior. It's all about human behavior. How can we make any changes without changing how humans inhabit the world and that, 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 that they live in? And so there are now different groups of scholars um, who are working on climate change um, I I within the social sciences. Some are, in fact, working exactly at this, this cross between psychology and economics. How do you sort of use little psychological tricks to change the way people behave? Um, we are, we're just launching um, 
a center called the Global Democracy Commons. And one of the things there is we're creating a lab for people to come together and figure out solutions. And the first lab is actually about climate change. How do we get together people who are, can, are working on precisely how to create people to change their attitudes um, towards climate change? Yeah, so let me just stop there. Thank you. And Sydney, in the student realm, how does Berkeley support student innovation? What are some of the obstacles that you and other students face in innovating? And how do you triumph over those obstacles? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think the university does a wonderful job of supporting students, especially in their pursuit to innovate. I think we have um, a slew of phenomenal programs and departments and uh, facilitators and administration in each department that are there for students along their journey in innovation. Um, just to name a few, I think um, programs like UCDC and Cal and Capital that allow students to go out into um, the real world in such a fast-paced environment and then come back to campus and like share that knowledge with other students is really, really powerful. I think other programs in our Haas um, School of Business are really powerful um, too because they, it really gets people in a room all together and it allows them to like share their ideas, um, bounce new ideas off of one another. And um, we were talking about earlier about how when you get so many brilliant minds in one room, you really, really do create an environment um, that leads to innovation. I think that's one of the main things that the Haas School of Business does really well is we have so many people who want to be future entrepreneurs or um, business owners and getting these people together and allowing them to inspire one another is really powerful. So I, I, say I'm a student. I, I, when I, you know, in my open hours, students often come to me and they give, they want to sell their ideas to me. And I'm quite sure why they think that's important, but they do. So I had some students who had a jitter-free coffee. Another set of students that wanted to build um, a ski lift from the Berkeley Bart up to the football stadium. Say I'm a, 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 a student and I have a really brilliant idea for for something other than make an appointment with the chancellor. What, what do I do? <laughs> Absolutely, I will say our students are very imaginative and they have amazing <laughs> ideas all the time. And that's something really unique to Berkeley as well. Um, I think um, a great avenue to really pursue um, ideas for innovation is connecting with grants on campus from research grants to scholarship grants to um, conference grants. I think. Um, Financial backing for um, ideas is really, really helpful, especially for college students who spend most of their time um, focusing on their academics. And um, some might not be able to, to be employed at this time to make their own money. So it's really helpful that the um, university um, is fiscally supporting them in their pursuit to innovate. So grants on campus. I also think connecting with um, research professors on campus who can kind of show you the ropes as you're um, kind of fleshing out your idea is really helpful. So having um, professors and faculty who are open to mentoring students and kind of being that guiding hand as they um, look into research is really helpful. And then also connecting with organizations on campus, one being the student government here, I think um, we try our best to um, provide students or connect students with resources on campus so that they can imagine any idea they have. So connecting with organizations who might be more knowledgeable about the different resources on campus is really, really helpful because um, like I said, like the Chancellor mentioned, students have these really impressive ideas and they really just need that kind of support system and mentor to be able to um, really um, or bring their ideas to life. Yeah, one of the things the Haas School is doing that I think is just amazing is, um, I mean, Berkeley in the, in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship is a little bit like it is in every area. There are a thousand flowers blooming and it's a little bit hard to see the garden, but the Haas School is building a center in one of the Julia Morgan houses that's uh, up on Gailey Road. Yeah. That'll be a physical place that any student can go and get direction about where, um, where they can take their idea. Can I offer, just consistent with that and with what you just said, students sometimes pitch me as well. Yeah. And one of the pitches I got very recently was, we have so much stuff, Thousand Flowers Bloom, on the Berkeley campus. Navigating it isn't easy. We're going to create 
an AI-driven, a large language model. We're going to feed it all the websites that make this <laughs> ecosystem go. We're going to feed it data on pathways that students actually take through the ecosystem. And we're going to give people a personalized recommendation of how they can best leverage the ecosystem. It's like, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Now, is it a business? I don't know. But it's sort of like, wow. I mean, the value of the ecosystem equals the opportunities in the ecosystem times its navigability. This is a navigability technology. It's like, I love that idea. So anyways, these things pop up all the time, and, and we need to get, get better at them. So this is a somewhat darker question. This has to do with innovation for evil. So Berkeley's intellectual fingerprints can be found on companies and inventions throughout time and across areas. OpenAI, the AI research company that produced ChatGBT and CRISPR, a genome en engineering technology, are two recent examples with Berkeley ties that have the power to change the world. They are changing the world. But the promise of these and other innovations hold are often tempered by legitimate questions that they'll do more evil than good or harm than good. What's, what is Berkeley's responsibility in the kind of ethical landscape of innovation is, are, are you, I mean, I've been presenting and you've been presenting this very optimistic and utopian sense of innovation, but is there a darker shadow of this world and how do we educate our community about those ethical implications? I, I'll let you go first. This is right down your alley. Um, yes, the social sciences are always prophets of doom. But, but <laughs> um, so the measure of a good innovation cannot be uh, by whether or not it can be monetized. But the measure of a good innovation has to be the good that it does in the world, right? So, you know, innovations don't happen, right? We we create them. So I want to make sort of two points here. The first is, yes, I'm going to give you the, the dark side. Innovations can happen under conditions, under bad conditions, actually. We have a historian called Caitlin Rosenthal who actually wrote a book about how many of the most popular business practices of 19th and 20th century America came into being in plantation slavery because the plantation owners could experiment with labor on slaves who were not free to leave, right? So were they innovations? Yes. But do we ever want innovations again under those conditions? No. So the first responsibility, I think, that Berkeley has is to ensure the kinds of conditions of freedom and choice that allow creativity for everybody to blossom. So that's our first responsibility, to create conditions of openness, free speech, thought, and collaboration for everybody, so that everybody can, um, can, can, can innovate should they want to, right? Um, the second responsibility is how do we teach future generations of innovators about how to embed the good and the ethical in their um, in their in their desires to innovate and in their innovations, right? Um, I approve of a jitter-free coffee. It will do a lot of people a lot of good, for example. But what we do is we actually teach a class on human context and ethics of data. It's our largest social science class. Thirteen hundred people took it last year, right? And it, it does exactly this. It actually embeds the ideas of ethics and it has people debate. Mm the ethics of innovation, and who are the stakeholders, who are the beneficiaries. So that's the second responsibility we have, to teach people who are going to innovate ethics. And the third, I think, the third is that this is a, some of a, this is a responsibility, but it's also a little bit of a complaint. I actually think that we have to embed social analysis in technological creation. Very often we create technologies or we make methodological in, in interventions or the COVID vaccine for heaven's sake. And then we're like, well, why aren't people using it? We need to embed social analysis in these innovations at the very beginning. So we understand why people will and will not use them. And when they use them, how will they use them responsibly? 
So this is a plea for social analysis to be respond to, to, to be allowed to be in the very beginning embedded in technological innovation so it is created in a more responsible way. Um, I'll say I think an effective method for um, making sure people consider ethics and innovation is holistic education. I'll say I'm a political science and African American studies double major, which are both in the College of Letters and Science and the Social Science Department. And um, when I first came to Cal um, and I was enrolling in my classes, um, I was told I had to take um, a seven breath uh, course um, classes, which is fall anywhere from like social sciences or social behavioral to um, physical science to environmental science to literature and arts. And my first reaction was, oh no, can I pass a physical science course? I'm not STEM. But my second reaction was, um, this is so nice that this university is challenging me and making me um, get a holistic education because I really do believe that um, when you're learning um, different aspects of different fields, um, you're learning more about how they apply to one another. So I think in innovation in um, a field like technology, um, if someone were to um, take a social behavior class and see how um, AI will affect people, um, that would go a long way in making sure they're using AI um, in a respectful and appropriate way. So um, I just want to commend the university for, um, one, the college's letters in science and the holistic education they're providing and making sure that ethics is um, at the root of our education here. I'll offer two quick points. Thank you for those points. Those are very helpful. Um, uh, Lisa Wymore is a faculty member here, uh, theater, dance, and performance studies. And I remember, so I'm going to come back to this arts and humanities, this, the, you know, the fields that are so fundamental, and the social sciences, to our ballast in this area. And she, she said to me one time, she said, Rich, do you under, I'm an economist, do you understand how important empathy is to critical thinking? Kind of not... The way I thought about it, critical thinking was, was, was a rational process. I'm an economist. I'm geared that way, right? And this idea that you can't really think critically about an issue unless you're seeing it from all sides. And that's a human thing. That's not just a, just a, a, a cognitive thing. Uh, anyway, so, so I think the humanities help us see things from angles that, that we're just not seeing. And, and that, the urgency of doing even more of that as we confront not just AI, but many of these other challenges is, is evident. The other thing that I would mention is consistent with what you said also, Rock. I think part, when, when you started and you said that, that clock speed of stuff getting into the world is, has gone way up. Part of that is, for those of you that know entrepreneurship, people talk a lot about customer discovery. That's just a jargon term. But the idea is, we talk, you know, tech transfer, it's like this one-sided push. It's like, that's really not the way it's working. I mean, the fundamental research is being done because of human curiosity, the curiosity of our faculty. But that next step down that translation pathway is no longer purely curiosity-driven. It's sort of like, what problems need to be solved out there? And, and so somebody mentioned it's a two-way process. This idea that we're one way throwing stuff into the world and it's getting done. It, it, society is giving us yeah, feedback, absolutely. and we are processing it much more effectively than we used to. That won't necessarily be 100% ethical, but it puts a lot of guardrails on, on some silly stuff that we might otherwise do. Thank you. So Berkeley innovators have discovered and created thousands of inventions. Um, in fact, we've just undertaken um, that, uh, you know, other school to the south. And nearly 300 startup companies and 800 products have come, th come through Berkeley patent licenses, according to our intellectual property office. So I want you each to tell us about an innovation, no matter where it was, when it was made, that you're particularly proud of in Berkeley's history, or that has had a profound impact on your life, or on an area that you care about. Would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, one innovation that's had a very profound impact on my life and just my experience at Cal is our Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center. This is an innovation that happened a couple years ago um, from student activism and um, administration receptiveness. Um, because of that, we had a um, resource center created in the Hurstfield annexes um, that are for black students to come and find community and find resources and just be with one another um, at a school as large as Berkeley. Um, my freshman year, 
I originally came as a political science major and then I took an African American studies course and I absolutely loved it. Like I fell in love with the material, the environment of being surrounded by other black students, by learning from a professor who looked like me and understood things I had gone through. I mean, being able to like um, take that knowledge back to the resource center and talk about it with my peers and my classmates is truly invaluable. Um, having the experience of coming to an institution that's diverse and um, that really values its students who are bringing different perspectives. Um, it's something that was unimaginable um, years back, but now it's a reality and it really, really does change someone's um, experience on a college campus. So that's an innovation I am extremely grateful for and I hope we continue to push the bounds in what we're giving to our students um, in that type of way. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me, Jim Allison, a faculty member yeah. here for many, many years, uh, he really started kind of cancer immunotherapy. His breakthrough on how we, how we harness the immune system to attack cancer. I mean, we've, we've had three ways to attack cancer for many, many decades, and now most of you know we are attacking it with a fourth way, the, the immune system. And his breakthrough, he won the Nobel Prize for this work, and it was done here. Um, I, part of why I'm, I'm connected to that, just, just loosely, I, um, was I got to, we reviewed recently the, you know, at the when you do an invention disclosure, so, so there's patenting and all that sort of stuff, right? But right at the beginning of that process, there's an invention disclosure form, right? And that's kind of before the patent is even, is even uh, applied for. And in handwritten notes, he has this graph of data that he's just produced, and he said, this is the result I'm so excited about. And it was it's kind of the history of science, and you're seeing it in, in his fingertips. It was anyway. So that that one felt very personal, and obviously, it's it's affected a lot of our lives. Well, I'm going to say the free speech movement. <laughs> Back in 1964, our students showed us that for the good society to be to be able to flourish. We must have the freedom to articulate our ideas without fear. In classrooms and outside of classrooms, and I know the free speech, will, the free speech has caused a lot of administrators a lot of problems this past year. It's not always easy. But it is the condition, I think, that allows Berkeley's innovation to flourish. The ability to articulate freely and without fear your ideas and to know that you can do that. So, 1964. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So now we have time for your questions. Yes? I, 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 wait for the mic when you ask a question. The um, city of Berkeley, as those of you who live here know, is very innovative with its roads and traffic control. <laughs> Those of us who came up Bancroft saw some of that work. And I think I read recently in the Daily Cal that students are uh, promoting, some would say agitating, promoting the idea of a traffic-free Telegraph Avenue. And I remember years ago when I would be driving down a street and there would be a huge barrier because the neighbors didn't uh, care for it. To me, this is emotional innovation. And sometimes, as is evidenced by Valencia Street in San Francisco, is a bit out of control. How, do you have any suggestions for not necessarily harnessing it, but perhaps better uh, discussing it? <laughs> That's a big and difficult question. I mean, there, there are community processes. I mean, when we think about how engaged we are in the political process, or, or not engaged, right? I mean, uh, I, I know for, for Berkeley, when we think about a development, for example, that's going to have some impact on the community, whatever it happens to be, and there are you know, open public fora for those things. And when you go to those things, people do show up, but it's, it's a very concentrated group. It's not, you know, it's, it's open, but, but it's a very concentrated group, and, and so, Concentrated interests tend to get, get a disproportionate impact on the outcome. So, you know, if we could sort of open that system further, kind of democratize it even more, reduce the frictions in, in each of us sort of expressing our interest in something. 
um, I, this is a controversial issue, not everybody agrees, but um, if, if we could sort of frictionlessly all weigh in on every public policy issue there is, we'd see some very different outcomes and we'd see some better ones. So th I think we do have ways to think about getting frictions out. You know, I, I mean, it's, it, what's so important is to talk to um, uh, government officials, which I do all the time. And I've talked many times with Jesse Arguin about his um, traffic vision. Um, that he that 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 he has, but um, uh, but we also have an institution for transportation studies and making even more use of the intellectual resources that we have on campus to solve some of these community problems might be a good idea. Um, I saw yes. Yeah. Uh, so I have a comment and two questions. So the comment is when he talked about how to manage the dark side, I was expecting to hear about thinking about what's the role of government and what are the guide rails that we'd like to see enforced because the free market is not free. It works within a set of rules. So I just suggest that. Then I have two innovations I wanted to ask you about. One is in terms of how the university itself, its rules and governance, is there any thought about how to innovate there so things can happen faster, particularly for non-academic institutions, which is my experience. And then the second is the fact that Berkeley has the same rules as UC Merced, which is the last time I checked has no Nobel laureates or anything else. Is there any thought about how to, how to innovate within the campuses so the campuses have a little more freedom to operate? So I just wondering if either of those two innovations are part of the future. I mean, I can just say very quickly about the, about the question of government. Um, you know, I started this discussion with talking about democracy, which of course is a form of government. Then when we talked about the city um, r traffic rules, you know, it's also about government. Everything is about that, that interaction uh, between um, citizens and, and, and society uh, and, 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 and the state, right? And, and it's always, you know, in a healthy democracy, there's going to be um, a certain level of friction. It's not going to be frictionless and pushback, right? And, and constantly it is citizens trying to get the state to create better guardrails, right? So yes, so I mean, I didn't talk about the, the state, but the state, the government is fundamental, um, or rather the relationship between the government and the citizens is fundamental in, um, in thinking about how to evolve a better society. If I, if I could just add one, one quick comment. Um, so in my, in my area, innovation and entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, the, the, the UC Regents and then the Office of the President, there has been a tremendous gestalt shift in terms of how innovation and entrepreneurship get done. There's been a tremendous localization of decision rights in my area. We are now allowed to do stuff and make decisions on this campus about innovation and entrepreneurship that we couldn't do two years ago. Uh, it, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, I'll just give you one concrete example. Um, when, when we license uh, technology, license intellectual property to a startup, right? And sometimes when we negotiate for royalties, of course we often do, we, we also sometimes uh, negotiate for equity in the startup, right? We want to participate in that nonlinear upside. It's part of how we fund this great public research university. Well, when we did in the past, and we have been doing this for 20 years, negotiate for equity, the equity would go to the office of the presidents, and so would the participation rights, the ability to do follow-on investments. And it got, like, no attention. They just localized the management of equity in startups that were acquired through, through licensing relationships. And now it's, it's quite a remarkable thing. Now it's like, there better be guardrails. You better be, figure out how to do this. But, but now all of a sudden, we're paying attention. And it's like, wow, we have these rights to, to invest more as Berkeley in some of these companies. That's actually a very valuable right that we were not using at all. So, so that, that decentralization and giving, giving the campus a little more latitude, I'm, as a governance shift, a trend, it's, it's a very positive one. Although I might add one small point. I just came back from Washington, D.C., where I was at the meeting of the American Association of Universities, Presidents and Chancellors. It's about the top 70 research universities in the U.S. and Canada. California has eight members of that group. 
everyone but Merced. And I think California's treating campuses as if they all could be a Berkeley someday has actually worked to California's benefits. So I'm less, uh, uh, less a champion of trying to treat the campuses differently, even though Merced is young and it's growing. Yes. You spoke about the three missions of the university, research, teaching, and public service. And I'd like to hear a lot more about public service. What are we really doing uh, for the state? What are we doing for communities, health, welfare, you name it? I just don't always observe that much is getting done, and it could be lack of knowledge yeah. on my part. Well, well there, there are many, many examples. I'll, I'll, I'll mention one, and, and please chime in. Um, this is at the Haas School, which I, which I know best, but there's a program called Social Sector Solutions. It's been running for two decades. Uh, and the idea is there are a lot of nonprofits out there, in, mostly in California, but they can come from anywhere. And they're sort of, yeah, we've, we've got a mission. We, we are con, you know, completely convicted, but we, we, we don't know how to do a business plan or figure out the business model or those kinds of things. And so we connect outside. They have to apply, and they have to be selected. But we connect almost all nonprofits, connect them to our MBAs and our undergraduate students to work on how do we make this a successful nonprofit? How do we make this a successful civic organization? There's much more demand than, than, than we can deliver, but the outcomes have been absolutely outstanding. And some major, major consulting companies are actually helping us deliver that. So they're using their pro bono time of people who are partners in all the highest, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So that's just one super concrete example, and it's connected to the, to the curriculum, and then students, of course, get an experience that, that you can't get in other ways. You know, every single student who comes to Berkeley says, or, and, and, and it's absolutely true, they want to serve. They want to serve their communities, they want to serve the world, they want to serve the country, and they all go out and do it. Um, I'm gonna give you two examples. Um, I think Sydney started with talking about students who go to DC or students who go to Sacramento. Our students populate the world, the, the sort of the civil servant service of California. Many, many of our students become the very people who um, help run um, this, 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 this state of ours. Um, we, um, we help the world globally. So we have all of these centers. There's so many of them, I'll just mention one. The Center for Engaged Global Action that is run by um, uh, several economists. And what they do is they are constantly, constantly innovating through the sort of behavioral economics that I was talking about, trying to figure out what are ways to minimize hunger, to create more sanitary practices in, 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 the, in the poor parts of the world. And every, you know, they, the, the faculty, the students, they are out there in the world trying to make these things happen. So I actually think that you probably would not, I don't think there's a university in the world that serves the world better than Berkeley. There is just not enough time to enumerate the, the examples, and I'm sorry we didn't lay them out for you, uh, but this is my, I, I really believe that there isn't a university in the world that serves better. If I could give one, one more quick example and then over to you, Sydney. But there's, there's a, a, an emergent and large group of faculty that, are, that they use the term community-engaged scholarship. Yes, so this yes, is in yes. that spirit. But if you Google community-engaged scholarship Berkeley, UC Berkeley, you'll see that there are so many. So instead of thinking about we do research on communities, we do research on, it's sort of like, no, we do it with. with. We do it interactively. We make sure that the problems we're working on are the most valuable problems, as opposed to just the things that we think might, might be the problems. And, and, and this feels like a trend that's going to continue, that, that in community-engaged scholarship. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think 
Um, Berkeley does do a phenomenal job of giving back to the community, and not just on a local scale, but on a global scale too. Um, and something also very fascinating is that um, these opportunities are organized not only by the school, but also by our own students. Um, I know students who have engaged in a program called Alternative Breaks, where they spend the spring break um, in uh, either like the Central Valley in California or even um, Columbia, and they build houses, or they um, engage in farm work, or they just um, study like the criminal justice system in these societies. I mean, I also know a program called um, Berkeley Project Day that's fully organized by students, and it gets um, registered student organizations from every like facet of campus, and it brings you together on one day, um, and you do it an entire day of service. Um, you go to like uh, nearby parks and you beautify them. Um, you serve um, even like the fire trails um, right here, and you go and um, do weed work. There's so many different opportunities, and I agree with you. I think it's a matter of connecting our um, students and people on campus with those opportunities. There's a question way in the back. Um, besides, the, besides the three functions you mentioned of education, uh, research, and public service, universities have historically had an important role uh, in, in new, in radical and revolutionary uh, ideas and have often been ar the origin of revolution even and uh, almost always managed to be contested within the, the larger system, as was Berkeley. I, w I came here in 64, so I well remember that and uh, other times too. And I wonder what your view is on, on how to... I don't. I don't know that you can manage that, but you can. You can be aware of that as a, as a very important role that universities play and have played ever since the art, the beginning of universities. Well, there are wonderful examples. Um, the free speech movement is one of them. The disability rights movement is another. Um, we were pioneers with the Department of African American Studies, uh, with ethnic studies. So there are all kinds of examples. They, they, they sometimes are not recognized as absolutely wonderful by the administration at the point they arise, <laughs> but, they're, um, but they certainly are. Yeah. Um, uh, they, 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 they become incorporated into the university and become you know, very important parts of our identity. Well, I, I, I think it's, uh, this would be the subject of another very long conversation, but I'll just say one thing, that I think that um, free speech is, um, needs people have to think about it in the context of our principles of community, that just because you have the right to say something doesn't necessarily mean it's right to say, and um, I think that's something we need to work on a lot. There are other questions. I see three more hands, and then I think probably it's a good idea for our, our to, us to have our refreshments and reception. Could you speak into a microphone? And the, um, I believe the Cal State colleges are all required to have menstrual products in the bathrooms. Would Berkeley take leadership and join and set the example for all the UCs to also have free menstrual products in the bathroom? That's I question we're one. Required to do that? Are you? Because yeah, I, I don't so. think it's in all the bathrooms. Well, I, but I think we're required to do it. Oh. <laughs> well, I look forward to the implementation of it because okay. my understanding is it is not required of the UCs. It is only required of the Cal States. No, I, th and, I, I thought it was also required of the UCs. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to hearing back about that because as a donor, I have donated to make that happen on yeah. an individual Great. level, and I would prefer to not donate 
for that if it's covered. Um, the second one is I believe that all colleges or many colleges require alcohol.edu. And alcohol.edu is, you know, alcohol is not legal until 21, which is your junior year in college. I would propose maybe Berkeley consider doing sex.edu. And I'm a physician. I specialize in teenagers. I'd be happy to give the talk on birth control options to make sure that everybody just knows things before they head into college. Yeah. It's a good, good idea. idea. It is. OK, there were two other hands up, and I can't quite remember where they were. There's one right there. At one element, I was just simply thinking, how does history fit into this ball game? Where do we find innovation in history? And uh, uh, Rocket, you made one excellent citation of a book that does precisely that, showing the interconnection of slavery with uh, industrialization. But so many people now innovate in history by just talking about, well, slavery, or just race, or tearing down buildings, which destroys history. Uh, that is not a very good way to approach history. On the other hand, we have Governor Ventus, what is his name, in Florida, who wants us to go into some imagined past. It's, it's a, how you cut your way between these is a very difficult thing to do, and I'm glad to see that. And some, some of us, Historians do try, but it's hard. Raka, why don't you talk about the conversation we were having earlier today about fractured histories? Oh, yes. So um, we were talking with the um, executive director of Cal Performances. I think he was here. Did he leave? Oh, he had run to a meeting. OK. About how uh, the topic of Cal, that Cal Performances wants to uh, sort of bring many of its uh, programs together, is it's called fractured histories. And we were talking about how, in fact, histories are increasingly fractured, contested, counter histories are being written, and how we can actually bring many parts of Cal together, together with sort of these amazing performances and dances and, and, and music pieces to, um, to, to show through, in, in different ways, to learn in different ways how to actually think about fractured histories, to think cerebrally, to think emotionally, to think, um, and, and to allow people who are, who feel like they inhabit fractured histories or contested histories um, to be a part of something larger than themselves. Yeah, there's a wonderful example on this campus. Uh, we're, we're discovering so many histories we didn't know before. So at, on the 150th anniversary of the admission of women to the University of California, a group of women faculty decided to have a kind of group archival project, um, which has been moving along as a wonderful website, trying to discover the history of women at Berkeley. So that's a really um, terrific thing. I'll add to, um, I think it's really important to also reevaluate history um, as we go along. I think especially as we um, embrace new um, perspectives and people from different communities that really impressive institutions like UC Berkeley, it's super important not only to um, admit them to this campus, but make sure they feel welcomed when they get here and make sure they feel supported when they get here. So um, in the conversation about renaming buildings, I think it's important to consider students who could be walking into that building, um, look up the person um, on the name or the name of the building and come to find out that that person was harmful to um, their ancestors. Um, I think that's something that we should always consider. Um, while also, like the Chancellor said, um, having archives and um, keeping a legacy um, and the record of that person alive, because I'm sure they did contribute to something meaningful, because they do have their name on that building, and that um, was earned. But also um, making sure that we're always um, reevaluating things and making sure our students feel comfortable here, too. because. In the past, when those buildings might have been named, um, the people um, at the institution probably looked completely different. And the names in the buildings were probably, uh, or the buildings were named with consideration to the people um, who would be studying at that university. And over time, the people at our institution has changed. So as we continue to admit more people and um, people from different backgrounds, it's important to um, keep them in the consideration process. Yeah, in fact, the, the Fannie Lou Hammer Center was um, uh, was the leader in creating this Black History Walk on the campus. 
I, I thought there was one more hand up. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. It's coming. Microphone coming. So there are a couple of things that actually resonated with me. One of the things uh, that you said about uh, innovation and then implementation or something like that, like uh, the thing that you used. And uh, one person behind me talked about uh, the traffic situation here in Berkeley. <laughs> so I thought uh, I, I it's just a question out of curiosity what uh, UC Berkeley is doing. Uh, about uh, the, the the traffic situation and the impact of that, uh, from the perspective of uh, the innovation that exists now with the EVs, right, the electric vehicles, mm -hmm. and not to you know give less importance to Toyota's hydrogen technology. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice and uh, a separate conversation. So, and I'm personally interested in this. I've actually started a project at home. I'm converting my Boxster to electric vehicle in my garage. So what the question is, what is UC Berkeley doing uh, to use the electric vehicle technology overall in the city and the campus? Uh, because there are so many people which uh, get affected by the emissions mm -hmm. and uh, the technology that exists. So what, if anything, there may be some things you're already doing, but what, if anything, that you guys are doing to use the electric vehicle technology to reduce the emissions in the city and therefore, you know, quasi help the traffic situation and or, you know, the atmosphere here. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm not an expert in that area and we have 30, I'm guessing the number of faculty who are experts in exactly that area, right? But, but I'm gonna answer it this way. You know, we long-term societal benefits. So something that all of us are connected with in some way is the Berkeley Space Center. Moffett Field. So we, when people are talking about a, a transportation that's electric, but also in the air, right? We're talking about like aerial electric transportation. We're talking about the way human beings move around in fundamentally different ways. So that's, I realize that's kind of a leapfrog on, on your very relevant question. I don't mean to take away from it. But part of our job is to be looking out 20, 30, 40 years and asking, you know, what, what does that transition look like? And this Berkeley Space Center at Moffett Field is absolutely astonishing. If you haven't seen the, the, the press conference that Carol and the team did, it's a partnership with NASA. It is cutting edge. It's going to involve industry in some very fundamental ways. Um, so, so that's some of the stuff that gets me excited. It's like we are looking at the horizon all the time. I, I hope we aren't neglecting, you know, tomorrow uh, on Berkeley streets. But, you know, our job is to, is to keep pushing that, that periphery. Yeah. Those students are certainly voting. I can't call it exactly voting with their feet because it's they're not feet, but using scooters and skate uh, electrified vehicles, which is part of what's creating the um, traffic crisis in Berkeley as we're trying to adapt to um, new modes of transportation that certainly young people are using a whole lot. Right, right. But the students are doing that uh, because of their necessity, right? But my question was about what is the university, because ultimately, Berkeley is a university town, right? Yeah. Whatever Berkeley does affects the rest of the city. So what is Berkeley doing in this regard? Because there's a lot you could do, mm -hmm. and it change a lot, you know, like, you know, no more gas vehicles in this amount of diameter or whatever this area, some simple thing. Mm -hmm. So yes, a Moffett field and all that stuff is very important. I'm an engineer myself, but what are we doing? I think we could probably put you in touch with the people who are working on these issues. The, three, the four of us happen not to, but I'm actually pretty sure across the engineering departments and certainly in the, in, in the transportation, the transportation. In, transportation. Yeah, there are people who are thinking about these things. Well, I want to thank all of you for, yes? Can I have one question? Yeah. Last one. Oh, last one. Okay. Last one. Okay, it's a great honor for me to ask a question. Uh, also to be here today, I'm the founder of Harmony Plus. In the past 10 years, yeah, okay. Okay, uh, I'm Bill Zhao, I'm the founder of Harmony Plus. In the past 10 years, I have brought hundreds of students to Berkeley. Uh, they are, in general, very happy and bringing more, encouraging more to come, go Bears. However, something preventing them to come is not inside the campus, actually it's something external. For example, there's a very sad news about Marco, the 19-year-old boy, 
who passed away two months ago. And uh, his grandma is my colleague, Esther Wojcicki. We have been discussing these days, uh, what can we do as outsiders to help Berkeley as a pioneer to innovate, to prevent drug taking mm. drugs? This is a serious question, and the safety is also an, a barrier for uh, more talents to come to this campus for wonderful education experience here. What can we do and what can the school to innovate? We want to support. Thank you. Another very important question. I, you know, from my perspective, I think, you know, student life and, and student experience, we've all seen the data on anxiety and depression, and these things are, you know, really epidemic levels. And so the, the kind of advice, I'm not saying we've solved this, right? But, but, we, but the chancellor and the whole team have put a lot more resource into making sure students know they have a place to go, a person to talk to, uh, a way, a way to, to, to progress. Um, specifically on, on drug use, I, I, I take your suggestion as something we could continue to, to, to do work on. Certainly fentanyl and some of the other things that are, that are taking lives uh, is, is something we, we have faculty that, that are working on very specifically. So I'm going to get a business card from you or a card, and I'm going to get a card from you, and we're going to follow up with some faculty names of people who are working on this, because I guarantee you we have faculty working on this. Now, and uh, just a, a, a short anecdote. On my way over, a student fell in step with me and said, do you mind if I walk with you? And I said, sure, no, fine. And he is creating a program um, for he uh, of prescription drug and uh, other drugs harm reduction and was really excited about finding the right place in the university. So this is an example where students are innovating in relationship to a very important problem on our campus. Yeah, I'll add first I want to say rest in peace to Marco. Um, absolutely. And um, the chancellor mentioned a new initiative um, by students to work on harm reduction for drugs. And I think that's really important because um, the first step is acknowledging that if our students are going to engage in this behavior, how can we make sure they're doing it safely? Um, the second thing is making sure they have um, the tools to do it safely. Um, and this initiative is called End Overdose. Um, I can connect you too with the people leading it on this campus, but it's an initiative that's been um, implemented across college campuses um, just recently, and it just came to Berkeley two years ago. So I think they're still in the um, early stages of getting it um, visible on campus and passing out their resources. Um, but they pass out um, fentanyl test strips on campus and they give presentations to registered student organizations, um, specifically also Greek life, um, to make sure that people are safe. Um, but I'd love to connect you with them and see how you can support. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and please go out to the garden and enjoy. And it's so wonderful to see all of you. Thank you.